On the whole, the emperors of Byzantium were more good than bad. The Byzantine Empire lasted twice as long as the main chunk of the Roman Empire after all. Nevertheless, Byzantium had its fair share of tyrants, maniacs and failures. We will be covering the worst of them today. To qualify for this list, an emperor must have reigned in the period of 395 to 1453. I'll also be including the Nicaean emperors, since it was they who retook Constantinople. Technically, Constantine VIII is the longest reigning Roman emperor in history, with a staggeringly long reign of 66 years. Fortunately for the empire, however, he spent most of that time in the shadow of others, acting as junior co-emperor. First with his father, then with Nikephorus II, then with John I, and then with his brother Basil II. It was only in 1025, when Constantine was already 65, that he came to full power, and very quickly, everyone realised why exactly co-emperor Constantine had never been entrusted with anything. His brother, Basil II, had left him a perfect example on how to properly run an empire, yet Basil and Constantine were as unlike as it was possible to be. Unlike his brother, Constantine VIII was weak and ineffectual, unable to stand up to the demands of ruling. Yet, as if to overcompensate for the weakness of which he was deeply aware, he responded to every perceived challenge with cruelty. Meanwhile, he neglected the management of the empire, allowing all important posts to be staffed by ineffectual secretaries, and meekly standing by while the Anatolian aristocracy increased their own power at the cost of the poorer farmers. In the end, Constantine's reign was prevented from being a disaster by two things. Firstly, he was too old to reign for long, limiting the damage he could do. Secondly, Byzantium benefited from the positive inertia coming off Basil II's reign and Constantine really inherited the empire at its peak. Constantine VI is most famous for being the unfortunate son of Empress Irene, with whom he engaged in several struggles for power until his mother had him blinded and deposed. He was the fourth ruler from the successful and popular Syrian dynasty, which from the time of its first ruler in 717 had provided Byzantium with an unbroken chain of competent emperors. It was Constantine VI who broke that chain. He came to the throne when he was only nine years old, so much of his early reign was overshadowed by his mother's regency. Yet even as he grew, it was apparent to all that the emperor was a deeply unimpressive figure. A majority of his reign's successes came during the time of his regency, under the cool-eyed gaze of his mother, Empress Irene. As soon as he came to power, he began making a mess of things. In short order, he proved himself short-sighted, cruel and inept, it was for these reasons that he was deposed by his mother, an event that could easily have been avoided if he possessed even a shred of common sense. He was the fully legitimate descendant of the last three emperors, and much of the army was behind him. Alas, he threw it all away. One by one, he alienated the pillars of state, first the army, then the church, then the people. After only five years of personal rule, he was cast down by his mother and blinded. A grim fate, but not entirely undeserved. Despite his short time on the throne, Alexander proved himself utterly unworthy of his illustrious Macedonian dynasty. He was short-sighted, lazy, spiteful, weak and foolish. He was not capable of running a corner shop, let alone an empire. In the space of a year, he triggered a disastrous war with Bulgaria and left a horrible situation for his nephew, the eight-year-old Constantine VII, by appointing Nicholas Mystikos as patriarch, a man who held a grudge against Constantine's father Leo, and held it against Constantine himself as well. If he had reigned for ten years instead of one, the damage his misrule might have done to the empire would have been great indeed. Alas, he died of exhaustion after a particularly strenuous game of polo, and thus Alexander passed from history, not a moment too soon. Constantine Ducas was a seemingly harmless man. Intellectual and well-read, he was cut from the cloth of a true Byzantine academic, yet in the final reckoning, his reign was little short of a catastrophe. Constantine X, ever the scholar, enjoyed nothing more than spending his time engaged in endless theological and philosophical debates. All the while, his empire began to crumble around him. Constantine, however, was too blinded by his own smug intellectualism to recognise and deal with any of the problems facing Byzantium. He belonged to the bureaucratic faction in the capital, which was opposed to the landed Anatolian aristocracy. As such, 
He tried to break the power of the army and reduce the power of the military aristocracy, yet in doing so he would gravely undermine the defences of the empire. To this end, he slowly destroyed the native army, underfunding and undermining it, while replacing it with ever greater numbers of mercenaries. Unable to consider the fact that the military aristocrats, proud, overbearing and dangerous as they may have been, were still Byzantium's best line of defence, he allowed the army to atrophy. On top of this, he began persecuting the Armenian church, turning what should have been a useful border region into a discontented mess. He couldn't have picked a worse time for any of this either. Just as he hacked away at the efficiency of the army, Byzantium was threatened on all sides. In Italy, the Normans conquered Calabria and assaulted Apulia. In the east, the Seljuks annexed most of Armenia, while Turkish raids annually punctured the imperial frontiers. All the while in the Balkans, the Hungarians continued to gain ground, while the Pechenegs threatened the Danubian frontiers. Luckily for him, he died before he could reap the catastrophic rewards of his policies, but when it finally did occur, much of the blame must lie with him, for hamstringing the army at such a time. Alexios IV Angelos will forever go down in history as the man that brought hellfire to Constantinople. As far as Byzantine princes go, it's perhaps not surprising that Alexios IV turned to the west for help. Going back to the time of Justinian II, ambitious rulers have turned to foreigners for help in regaining their throne. It's easy to point the finger at Alexios in hindsight and laugh at how stupid he was, but I think any pretender probably would have leapt at the opportunity the Fourth Crusade presented, yet I doubt any of his predecessors would have done as much damage in the process as he did. In his attempts to gain the trust of the Crusaders, he made extravagant and unachievable promises of vast rewards of gold, and also of bringing the Byzantine church under the control of Rome. Now, when he finally did make his way to the throne, he can't be fully blamed for his failure to cough up the cash. His uncle and predecessor, Alexios III, ran the empire into the ground and left the treasury barren. Nevertheless, Alexios IV's awful handling of the situation eventually led to a complete breakdown in relations, leading to the eventual siege and sack. Throughout this entire saga, he managed to trip over his own shoelaces at every turn, proving himself short-sighted, unwise and stupid. He would quickly be deposed by his own people, and shortly afterwards Constantinople itself would be put to the sword. Phocus was perhaps the most infamous emperor ever to hold the purple. Tales of his cruelty and despotism cling to him like miasma. While the downfall of Maurice started a brutal war between Byzantium and Persia, yet is his reputation deserved? Well, sort of. He wouldn't be on this list if it wasn't, but later propaganda makes telling fact from fiction a tricky business. Many would place him lower down on this list. The blame for the last great Byzantine-Sassanid war has always somewhat unfairly been laid at Phocus's door. During the latter 6th and early 7th centuries, Byzantium was perennially bankrupt, forcing emperors to slash soldier pay and take cost-cutting measures. As a result, morale was always low, especially when fighting enemies that didn't promise loot. So when Byzantium was stuck fighting the Avars and Slavs in the Balkans during Marusa's reign, the soldiery snapped. In 593, Maurice ordered the men to winter in the wild and lonely lands north of the Danube. The men mutinied, and a disaster was only avoided when Maurice's general disobeyed the emperor and took them south. A decade later, Maurice gave the same order for the men to spend the winter north of the Danube, with predictable results. They mutinied, and this time their general wasn't brave enough to defy imperial orders, and thus was killed by the mutineers, who chose Phocas as their leader. I say all this to make it clear that it wasn't just the case of that evil bastard Phocas killing that luckless hero Maurice. No, Maurice actively chose to order them across the Danube for the winter. It was a decision he had made before, in 593, and it had led to near mutiny then. It was, as such, a decision with predictable consequences. Maurice should have known better. Alas, he didn't know better, as he learned to his sorrow. Prior to this final disaster, Phocas had been part of a delegation to the capital, asking the Emperor for more pay. Maurice, ever short on funds, had bluntly refused. To do as many have done and present Phocas as the ultimate villain of the 7th century is not just oversimplified, but naive. As Emperor, tales of Phocas's cruelty and despotism are not without merit. His years on the throne were overshadowed by paranoia, yet Phocas was not entirely a failure on the throne. The Balkan frontier along which he served during the reign of Maurice remained strong, 
but the Persian front suffered a gradual collapse as the governor of Mesopotamia went over to Persia. It should be remembered though that the greater collapse of the eastern lands happened after his reign. Now don't get me wrong, Phocas was a bad emperor. During this time of supreme crisis, he failed to provide the empire with a strong centre, instead spending his days meeting out unjust punishments on perceived foes. He inspired little love or loyalty, and in the end, his own son-in-law begged the Heraclians to overthrow him. And that they did, during which time the Persians took advantage, further weakening the Eastern Front. When Andronicus II came to the throne in 1282, Byzantium sat at a crossroads. Just two decades ago, Constantinople had been recovered. Was it such a stretch to imagine that the empire might recover too? It was possible, but it was a long shot. It would require hard work, good leadership, and some luck. Unfortunately, Andronicus II was bereft of all three. The Byzantine Empire was hard-pressed on all sides. In Anatolia, the Turks pressed inexorably onwards, while in Europe the empire was threatened by the forces of Catholicism, as well as the other Orthodox Balkan states. Andronicus's response to these threats was to completely defund the army. He also disbanded the navy, a catastrophic move which allowed the merchant republics of Genoa and Venice to dominate imperial waters more firmly than ever before, and demand far higher prices for their naval services. Furthermore, Constantinople itself would become a battleground between the two republics, as Andronicus found himself utterly powerless at sea. Throughout his reign, the empire was defeated continuously on all sides. A special mention must go to his son, Michael IX, who never ruled as senior emperor but often led the armies, and despite being a soldier for over three decades, he won no major battles, not one. This can't just be blamed on Michael though, and it's testament to the utterly shambolic state of the Byzantine army by this point. As a result, nearly all of Byzantine Anatolia was lost to the Turks, while Bulgaria continued to chip away at the Byzantine holdings in Thrace. The real insult was simply just how long he ruled. For more than four decades, he was content to watch the empire slide into ruin. In that time, so much could have been done, and if a more capable person sat the throne, the decline might have been halted. As it happened, Byzantium was left ruined by Andronicus. Anatolia was almost gone, and shortly to be conquered. Thrace had been ravaged by the emperor's enemies, the economy was in decline, and trade was dominated by the Italians. In the end, Andronicus would be deposed by his own grandson. If there was even a brief flickering hope that Byzantium might survive, by the end of his reign, that hope had been extinguished. Andronicus Komnenos was swept onto the throne by a wave of xenophobic terror. His reign baptised in the blood of the Latins massacred in Constantinople. This would set the tone for much of his brief reign, although Andronicus was, at least initially, quite popular. The Latins were hated in Constantinople, and the locals were happy to see them go. Yet by throwing their lot in with Andronicus, the Byzantines soon realised that they had leapt headfirst from the frying pan and into the fire. They say that absolute power reveals a person's true nature, and that was certainly the case with Andronicus who sank deeper and deeper into depravity with each passing month. He was utterly without remorse and quickly became reviled throughout the empire for his brutality and ruthlessness. He did, it was true, try to cut back on corruption in the state bureaucracy, but he was so heavy-handed in the process that he only sparked more hostility from the nobles. No one was spared from his pitiless eye, and after only two years on the throne he was deposed in an outburst of brutality that, even by Byzantine standards, still shocks. Andronicus was first partially blinded and then had his hand cut off, before his enemies exposed him to the fury of the people, who attacked him remorselessly for days. He was beaten, stoned, covered with shit and boiling water, before being strung up by his legs, where the agonies only continued. The mercy of death came only some time later. It was perhaps the most horrific death suffered by any emperor in Byzantium's history, and it was the fullest measure of the hatred with which this tyrant was viewed. Yet while the Empire was rid of the tyrant that day, the Empire could not be so easily rid of his legacy. For in the West, the Normans were attacking, and Andronicus's paranoia, and Andronicus's paranoia had prevented him from organising a defence, since he didn't want to trust any one general with an army. As such, the Normans had been able to punch their way to Thessalonica, the second city of the Empire, which had been brutally sacked and plundered. By the time Andronicus died, 
Normans had advanced halfway from Thessalonica to Constantinople, and there was every chance that they would have been able to attack the capital had Andronicus not died and more sensible leadership taken his place. Despite the low bar set by the Angelos dynasty, Alexios III managed to plumb the depths of incompetence. He was a truly awful ruler, possessing not one ounce of backbone or foresight. Yet while he lacked ability, he had ambition in spades, a fatal imbalance that led to him callously blinding his own brother, Isaac II, and driving his nephew, another Alexios, into exile. With Alexios III at the helm, the Byzantine decline only hastened, and he allowed the empire to be mercilessly bullied by its neighbours, while its military might continued to wither. Isaac's son sought revenge against his uncle, bringing the Fourth Crusade down upon Byzantium. Alexios III's cowardice and catastrophic mismanagement of Constantinople's defences meant that the Crusaders were able to force their way inside the city. Alexios III fled, and Alexios IV was enthroned. Unfortunately, the new emperor discovered that his uncle had left the treasury almost completely empty, and he was unable to fulfil his promises to the Crusaders. The rest, unfortunately, is history. Soon after, the greatest city in Christendom was put to the sword. Alexios III himself would survive the catastrophe by seven years, before he was finally imprisoned by the Emperor of Nicaea, and sent to the exile he so utterly deserved. Michael Ducas was always more content to be ruled rather than to rule himself, and although he was already 17 when his father died, he was judged so ignorant of governance that his mother immediately remarried so that Byzantium would have a competent emperor at the helm. Michael, having about as much resilience as an empty crisp packet in the wind, made no protest. He simply didn't care for the job of emperor. To him, it was a bore and a chore, nothing more. Yet his new stepfather, Romanus IV, most famous for his defeat at Manzikert, remained only on the throne for three years. The defeat at Manzikert is often pointed at as the pivotal moment when Byzantine Anatolia collapsed, but this isn't the case. The victor of Manzikert, Alparslan, made fairly modest demands in the aftermath of his victory, and released Romanus IV to enforce them. Unfortunately, Michael's family, the Dukids, had little love for Romanus, and they had him captured and blinded. Then, in 1072, Michael tore up the treaty Romanus had signed with Alparslan. Ultimately, it was this breach of faith that drove the Turks to invade Anatolia. So, for the next seven years of Michael's disastrous reign, the Byzantine Empire was disemboweled by the Turks. During this time of supreme crisis, as the Empire shrunk by well over 50% in only six years, Michael VII continued to flirt with disaster at every turn. He fell under the influence of increasingly corrupt and self-serving figures, who continued to run the Empire into the ground for their own benefit. Michael, meanwhile, ordered massive debasements to the Solidus, Byzantium's gold coinage, speeding up the process of debasement that had been taking place over the 11th century. The result was further trade breakdown, a loss of imperial prestige, and rampant inflation. Michael was eventually taken out when two generals revolted at once, in 1078, leading to the emperor's eventual downfall. Unfortunately, the damage had already been done. The empire had suffered a blow from which it would never recover. Many thanks to my generous Consul T YouTube member, Chris Manger, for supporting the channel. Being a YouTube member really is the best way to help the channel out, so if you want to see more then consider doing that.